Hello, everyone. Welcome. Thank you for coming. This talk is called How to Do Code Reviews Like a Human. My name is Michael Lynch. So I wrote this talk after uh, working at Microsoft and Google for a number of years. And both of those companies treat code review as a first class citizen. Uh, every line of code that uh, gets merged into any code base goes through rigorous code review. Um, and as a developer, I, I love code reviews. They're, they're one of my favorite parts of working on a dev team. I think a lot of my growth as a developer has come from having my code critiqued and doing careful reviews of other people's code. So I started thinking about what, uh, what techniques make a code review good. And I started reading articles about code review best practices. And I noticed something that was kind of odd about these articles in that they, they all seem to focus on elements of code review that I, I never really struggled with. And they weren't the parts of code review that I, I saw other developers uh, really struggle with either. So uh, to give you an example of what I mean, this is if you Google code review best practices, uh, this is one of the top results. And I, I don't mean to pick on them. They're, they're all pretty similar to this. Um, and it's sensible advice. It it's, says things like review fewer than 400 lines of code at a time, uh, pace yourself. But the thing that's odd is that they're all centered around the idea of bugs. So you're, you're reviewing for fewer than 400 lines of code so that you can find the most bugs. The, the chart they show is a graph of uh, bug discoveries as a function of changeless size. And so I think that finding bugs is a, is a useful outcome of code reviews. But to me, it's not the most interesting thing that happens in a code review. Um, for me, as I mentioned, I think code reviews are, are a great tool for learning. And I think it's also uh, a social and, and kind of a bonding activity among teammates. And so focusing so strictly on, on bugs, to me, felt like it was, it was missing the point. Um, so yeah, to, to think about what, what isn't covered. You know, in, in real life, when you, you tell somebody a list of things that they are doing wrong or things that they need to improve, we, we think of that as a hard conversation. So we don't think of it as like, oh, just give them a list of things they did wrong and the problem is solved. We, we think about how to approach the conversation with tact and, and empathy to help them react and like re respond positively to the things that we want them to improve. Um, and also, if, if it's a learning opportunity, we, we don't really uh, you want to think about how you're going to give them information in a way that's going to help them to learn. So if you, if you give them somebody a list of 50 different mistakes they're making, it's, it's unlikely that they're really going to learn effectively that way if you just tell them to learn 50 things all at once. Um, so I, I thought, maybe I'm wrong. And um, so I, maybe, maybe people really do like hearing a list of their deficiencies. So I decided to write a book. Um, it's called The Developer's Guide to Happy Romance. It's a guide to dating where you meet your romantic partner by just meeting people and then um, listing all the things that are wrong with them. So you, you start dating somebody and just say all their personality defects. Apparently, that's, that's a really good strategy uh, for code review, so why not for, for dating? Um, the book didn't do very well. So I came back to code reviews. So I'd like to, to think about code reviews with some assumptions in mind. So the first assumption is that code reviews are, are about more than just finding bugs. I think they're, they're a bonding activity and a learning activity for, for you and your teammates. Um, my second assumption is that you work with teammates who are human. And when I say this, I mean that they have human emotions. So if you say things to your human teammate that would be upsetting to a human, they're going to find it upsetting. Um, and similarly, if you, uh, they learn in ways that humans do. So if you try to teach them 50 things at once, humans don't learn that way. So that's, that's going to be a problem. Um, and so before I go any further, I just want to clarify what I mean when I say a code review, uh, because people use the term to refer to like looking over somebody's shoulder and giving them a thumbs up anywhere to like something as formal as a 12-person meeting where everybody has printouts of the code. What, what I'm describing is something kind of like the, the workflow of a GitHub, GitHub pull request. So it's, it's written in asynchronous. So it starts when the author creates a change list for, for review. And they send that to the author. And the code review happens in one or more rounds. So a round is one round trip between the author sending a change list to the reviewer and the reviewer responding back with, with feedback. Um, and the, the review continues in this loop until the reviewer gives their approval, also known as an LGTM, or looks good to me. And then the author makes any last changes and merges it into the code base. So with that in mind, I want to go through uh, some tips on how to do code reviews like a human. So number one is settle style arguments with a style guide. So developers love to have these pointless arguments about like tabs versus spaces. And they're really a waste of time, because spaces are clearly better. 
But even if your team doesn't believe that and, and you, you, you have disagreements on your team, like you don't really want to waste time on every review, arg like having this argument over and over. You don't want to have this argument with every new developer that joins your team. You want to have a style guide that just settles it once and for all. And so there are existing style guides out there. Google has great style guides for a variety of languages, um, but there's, there's plenty of others if, you, if that one doesn't work for you. Um, if you can't find a style guide that you like, you can build your own incrementally. And it's, it's easy to do. If anytime you have an argument like tabs versus spaces, you, you bring your team together and say, like, what, as a team, what can we agree on? OK, it's tabs. Like, put that in the style guide, and that's the decision from, from then on. Like, anytime you want to have an argument in the future, just defer to the style guide, and you avoid the argument, because there's now a, a guide that says what the right thing is. So number two is similar. Let the computers do the boring parts. So um, in, in Python, there's a ton of, of linters and formatters that can automate away a lot of the uh, manual parts of the review. So um, Computers are really good at, at doing things like uh, getting the white space correct or, or telling you that your imports are out of order or that you have an unused variable. Humans can do it, but they're not as good as, as computers in a lot of cases. And so you really don't need to use humans for that. Um, the, the big advantage of that, if you can automate a lot of your style, style rules, um, it, it creates a really tight feedback loop for when people join your team and they're, they're trying to learn your style and, and the coding conventions in the code base. It's, it's very easy for them to learn if they can just run a tool and get the feedback immediately as opposed to send the, the change list out for review, wait for a few days, or hours or days to get the feedback and then find out that, oh, like I can't check this in because I, I made some like minor uh, violations of the style guide. It's, it's just a, a quicker way to learn. It's also healthier for them, for your teammates to, if they're going to get frustrated over pedantic rules, it's, it's healthier for them to say like, oh, stupid pilot instead of like, oh, stupid Anna for like holding up my code. Um, so just like, it's, it's easier for them to, if they're going to be mad about the pedantic style guide, let them be mad at the tool rather than the person. Um, there's also, uh, options for doing like code builds and running unit tests in continuous integration instead of like having a, a person do this. So 10 years ago when I was a developer at Microsoft, we would do these things called buddy builds where um, during a code review, your teammate would send you code. You'd have to create a clean source tree, merge their change list into that source tree, build it, and then report back whether it built. I really hope they're not doing that anymore because that's crazy. That's like that was a huge waste of time. Um, and fortunately, now we have tools that do that really well: uh, Circle CI, uh, Travis CI, Jenkins, whatever. Um, just as long as it's not humans. Um, yeah. So. Don't use humans for that. And the reason for all these, these tips is that developer time is very scarce. I, I very rarely talk to teams that say, like, oh, we have so many developers. They're so cheap and plentiful. We don't know what to do with all of our easy to find, talented developers. Um, if you have developers, like, you really want to use their time well. And beyond that, developer focus is even more scarce. So if you have a developer that works eight hours a day, they probably can't write code and do code reviews for the full eight hours a day. Just logistical problems aside, like you, you get burned out. And it's also just in terms of focus. If, if you have to do a code review and there's 80 things for you to look for, you're going you're gonna to have a harder time finding those things as opposed to if you, if you can eliminate like half those possibilities because you, you can trust that tools will find those things. So if, if you know you don't have to ever worry about unused variables or, or white space because the tools will find that for you, you can focus on the things that on, like, only humans can figure out. Like, uh, is this architecture intuitive? Is, is this class well named? Um, those are things that computers can't do. Um, that's going to change soon when machine learning takes all of our jobs. But for now, like, you need humans for that. And so you should reserve that for just humans. So number three is be generous with code examples. So um, think about when, when, you're, uh, when the author is sending a change list for review. Sometimes they might be under a deadline. They, they're trying to get code checked in. And you know, in theory, everybody wants to get the code to be as, as good as possible. But if you say, like, oh, you, know, you have this 20-line this function. If you use this slightly better API, you can do it in 18 lines. They might get annoyed. It, it might seem like you're, instead of being like a supportive teammate, you're a pedantic gatekeeper. And you, you don't want that. You want to show that your teammate that you're, you're trying to be helpful. And so code examples, if you there's no reason that you can't just show the, the code that you're talking about. So if you have a better idea, if you have a, an idea for an 18-line function using a slightly different API, you can just write that and show it to them. Um, and and that, that builds a lot of trust between the author and the reviewer, because it shows that you're not trying to be the gatekeeper. You're, you're willing to do heavy lifting and, and donate some of your time to 
help your teammate out and make their change list better. Um, and so just to give you an example of that, because I, I've just told you that it's nice to give examples. So if you're an experienced Python developer, you might look at this code and you're, if, if you were doing a view, your first reaction might be to say, you can simplify that with a list comprehension. So it's, it's generating some uh, URLs. But if, if you're an experienced developer, you see that's, that's a problem that list comprehensions were sort of made to solve. So if you say that and your teammate wrote this code for you, it's likely that if they wrote the code that way, they either don't know what list comprehensions are or don't feel comfortable enough using them to know how to, how to use them to solve that problem. So if you just said that to them, now they feel like, oh, now I have to spend a few hours researching list comprehensions and understanding how I can apply that to this problem. But it's, it's like slightly more effort for you to just say, consider simplifying with a list comprehension like this. And you show them exactly the way to, to solve the problem using list comprehensions. So that, that gets them unblocked really fast and shows them exactly how to use the technique that you're advocating. So number four is never say you. Um, and this is, this is one that I kind of get some pushback on. So bear with me and see what you think. Um, so for example, if you say in a code review, you misspelled successfully. So you in this room can hear that I said that, the, you can hear that my tone of voice and you can see my face when I say that, that I, I'm not saying in a cruel way and it doesn't sound like I'm bullying you. But if, if you're uh, an author and you're feeling defensive about the code review or you don't know what your relationship is exactly with this person that's reviewing your code, it's easy to, if, if you're doing this just in text, it's easy to misinterpret a comp comment like that and think, ugh, you misspelled successfully. Like, I can't believe you misspelled successfully. You, you, because it's text, there's, there's this information loss where somebody can read it in a way that you didn't mean it. And I think a big problem of, with comments like this is that you're saying you, and you brings ego into the discussion. So in theory, you would want the code review to be a perfectly objective discussion, and it doesn't matter who came up with the idea, it's just whatever the best ideas come out of the discussion are what go into the code. So you want to focus on the code, not the coder. In practice, humans aren't really like this. If, if a human expresses their idea, they, they have, have some ego tied up with the idea, and they're going to feel, um, feel associated with whatever idea they proposed or whatever code that they wrote. And so you can avoid reminding them of this ego if you just avoid saying you in, in your code comments. And it's, it's very easy to do this if you can just write around the you. So um, my first technique is, technique is just always to, instead of say you, to say we. So instead of saying, can you rename this variable, you can just say, can we rename this variable? And what I like about this is that it reinforces the, the team ownership of the code. Um, some developers think of the code as like, I wrote this code, so it's mine, I own this code. When really you don't, it's, it's the team that owns the code. If, if you're out sick or you leave the team, it's, it's not you that goes on maintaining it, it's the team in, in some way or another. And so saying we reinforces this idea and says that this is, this is a collective effort, we are making decisions about how to make this code as good as possible. The downside of this is that sometimes you can sound a little silly because like really you're not do you as the reviewer aren't really doing anything. If you say like, can we refactor this class? You as the reviewer aren't doing anything. It's the author who's gonna do it. Um, so sometimes you can sound a little bit ridiculous because you're advocating work that we are gonna do that you are not. Uh, but between like sounding a little silly and avoiding ego, I prefer to sound a little silly. But if you don't like the we, you, there's a lot of other ways to avoid that. Just remove the subject, so suggest rename this variable. Passive voice, variable should be renamed. Uh, or what about, like, what about renaming this variable? I think they all express the exact same idea um, and just leave out the U and, and eliminate this, this opportunity for misinterpretation. So uh, frame feedback is requests, not commands. So what's odd is that you would expect, because it's, it's a sensitive discussion, you would expect people to be more polite in code reviews than they are in, in normal discussion. But in practice, I found it to be the opposite. People tend to be a little bit more rude and brusque in code reviews than they are in real life. Like, you would never say to your coworker, hand me that stapler, then fetch me a soda. But it's, I see all the time people will say, like, rename this class, move this to a different file, where like, it's the way that you would, you would speak to a subordinate and not somebody that you see as your equal or in your peer on the team. So comparing the this, this same idea in, in two different framings, so like move the food class to a separate file, it sounds a little bit like bossy, whereas opposed to uh, if you frame it as a request, 
can we move the food class to a separate file? It feels more collaborative, like it, you're making a request of them. People like to feel in control of their work, and so when, when you frame it as a request, it, it lets them maintain that autonomy. Um, so, and, and the other reason is that like, you're not always going to be right. There's sometimes where you're going to think something's wrong with the code and make a suggestion, and it's actually, you miss something. The, the author can say, like, there's actually something that you didn't consider, and there are reasons why I made this decision. And so if, if you frame it as a command, it, it makes it really hard for the reviewer, for the author, rather, to push back. So imagine if you say, move the foo class to a separate file. For the author to push back, it's now like they're disobeying a direct order. So it's like they have to say, I don't want to do that because then it's far away from bar, blah, blah, blah. Um, it's like a very contentious argument already, as opposed to if you say it like a request, can we move the foo class to a separate file? The author can say, we could, but then it's far away from bar. Like, what do you think we should do? That, that feels like a much more collaborative discussion. Um, of course, I made both these conversations up so they can be as hostile or as friendly as I want them. But I think you, you can imagine this is kind of maps to real life. So next is offer sincere praise. Um, a, lot of, a lot of people think that code reviews are, are just an exercise in finding fault. Uh, you're just looking for bugs or things that are wrong with the code. But there, there's really no rule against saying what you like about the code that you're reviewing. So when I'm reviewing code, I like to look for things that, that delight me. So like, oh, I wasn't aware of this API. That's really useful. This is an elegant solution. Breaking this function up was a great idea. Like Things that you really like that your, your teammate does, like call them out. There's no reason not to call them out. And it, it builds this friendliness into the review so it's not just an exercise and like, you did this wrong, you did this wrong. Um, the other benefit is that it, it helps for learning. So if, you, if you've seen uh, your teammates struggle with something on a previous review, like maybe they, they have trouble writing code comments in a clear way, and you see that on, on this change list they've done a really good job, you can say, like, this is a really concise, clear comment. This is like great job. And so they recognize that they've put effort in, and, and it's being recognized. So that helps bring, bring trust to the, the author and the reviewer. So number seven is aim to bring the code up a letter grade or two. And so when I say this, whenever I get code for a review, I, I give it a letter grade from A to F. Um, and I do this in my head. I don't, I don't tell the author this is a D minus change list. Um, and so A is code that's amazing. It's, it's code that like, I can barely think of anything to fix because it's in such a good state already. And F is uh, it's either functionally incorrect or it's, it's so unintelligible that I can't tell whether it's, it's functionally correct or not. So I used to think that like, why not just make the code as best as it can be? Like, if, if I have ideas to help, if, if I got it as a D, like, why not just do everything I can to bring it up to an A? So the problem is that developer patience is finite. So if, if you send me a code review and um, you expect to be done in half a day or a day, and it's two weeks later because I have some new idea in round 20 of a code review for like how to reduce a, a line of code in the class, like you're going to be really frustrated and you're probably going to hate me and you're not going to be taking my feedback in, in good spirit. Um, and the stress level increases the longer that you go in a review. So if, if, you, if you are in week three, you're just like not in a place where you're open to feedback anymore. So instead, uh, I try to think about the long term. So instead of trying to, if I get a, a D minus, instead of trying to strangle it to an A, I try to bring it up to a letter grade or two. I'm, I'm going to be working with this teammate for a long time. Not every change list has to be perfect. So if I can get it up to a C minus, like that's good. I'm happy with that. Um, and so you might worry that if, if you accept C minus code, you might end up with a code base that's just mediocre. In practice, I find that if you help somebody get from a D minus to a C minus, the next time you get code from them, it's going to start at a D plus or a C minus, and you can, you can bring them up a letter grade again and eventually get to the point where you're, you're going from B's to A's. So lastly, uh, uh, handle stalemates proactively. A stalemate is when the reviewer reviews, refuses to sign off on the change list uh, until the author makes some changes, but the author, for whatever reason, refuses to make those changes. And so you, you're just locked in this, um, in this battle where you're not going anywhere and the, the code's not making progress. Um, so knock on wood, I've only been in one stalemate in my career, but it's, it was very unpleasant. Um, it's sort of like being in an argument on the internet where like, when you're in it, you're, you're feeling like, oh, like, everybody watching this is going to see how righteous I am. Like, I'm so right. The other person's being crazy. But in reality, it's, it's like being in an argument on the internet where like, nobody else really cares. They just see two idiots arguing, and they can't work something out between themselves. So you want to avoid this as much as possible. And so you have to recognize the signs of an impending stalemate. 
So the, the first sign is that the tone is growing tense or hostile. Um, if, if you feel, feel like you're writing comments that are kind of passive aggressive or the person is responding to you in a way that's hostile, that's a bad sign. You want to you wanna get away from that. Um, if the notes per round are not trending downward, if usually on a review you'll start with like maybe 15 notes and then it'll go down to eight, then three, then you'll approve. But if it's like 26, then 22, then 25, that suggests you guys are talking past each other. That's a bad sign. Um, and you're getting push if you're getting pushback on a lot of your notes. So you're not always going to be right, as I've said. Like sometimes you're going to get pushback. But if it's a lot, if it's like over a quarter of your notes, the person is just refusing to do it. That's a sign that you guys are not communicating well, and it, it could be a stalemate coming. So you want to handle this proactively. Um, so the best option is to talk it out in person, if possible. Just like the most uh, human communication possible. Like try to get away from written talk in person. If not that, video chat. If not that, phone. Um, but like give as many like normal communication signals as possible. Um, it could be like because it's a design like design decision that's bigger than two of you. If you're talking about like. Uh, the change list moves from like MySQL to Postgres. Like that's a big decision that shouldn't just be in the hands of the two people that happen to be on the review. Maybe it requires a design review. Say like, hey, maybe we should bring this team to the team and discuss as a as a whole what we should do. Um, and if those two don't work, you're left to either concede or escalate. And by concede, I mean just say like, you you, you say like, I, this isn't the way I, I hoped it would go. But then you just hope for a better outcome next time. You, you like you're not going to get this one perfect. Um, and if you, you really can't do it, if it's like introducing a security vulnerability or like horrible user data loss, um, then escalate to like a tech lead or a manager, and plead your case to them. But if that also doesn't go your way, you just have to like take it and, and hope for a better outcome next time. Because if you just stay in it, it's just going to get worse. Um, so after a stalemate, the the best thing to do, like it's it's probably not about the code itself. It's it's probably more about the relationship. So you want to uh, talk to your manager, see if you can, like he can help repair the relationship. Um, take a break from each other if you can avoid sending each other change lists for a little bit. Um, study conflict resolution. I liked crucial conversations training a lot. Um, I think those are are really useful. So these are just to review again, but I've got a minute. Um, so just. I want to wrap up. There's no single right way. Um, all the things I've talked about are just tools, different options that you can use during a code review. Um, and it's really going to de depend on like your team, your personality, and the personality of, of the person you're reviewing for. Um, and so these are all just different options. Just the, the best thing you can do is be introspective and cognizant during the review of, um, like, are my techniques working? Am I, are, are my generating tension during this review? Am I getting the code quality to the level that I want? Um, so that's it. Uh, this, this talk is based on a blog post I did. If you want to Google human code reviews, you can see uh, a, a bit more discussion. Uh, that's my email and Twitter. And if you want to access the slides, they're online at that link. Um, but yeah, that's all. Thank you so much, everybody. Thank you.